Good morning, First United. I'm Dylan Reed, the Director of Youth Ministries here at the church. And I just wanted to give you a couple updates about some programming coming up for our youth ministry. So we have our ski retreat coming up. That is January 13th through the 16th at Beach Mountain, North Carolina. We're going to have tons of activities like skiing, snowboarding, tubing, sledding, um, and worship, and a speaker. And so it's going to be great. So whatever you like snow-related, make sure you join us for that as well. I hope to see you real soon. First United and the Gathering Place. I'm Sarah Keene and I wanted to talk to you about Operation Christmas Child. This is a charity that gives shoeboxes filled with toiletries, school supplies, and toys to children in need around the world at Christmas time. This year, my partner Jim Fisher and I are hosting a talent show at First United Methodist Church on Thursday, October 6th from 5.30 to 7.30 p.m. Everyone is welcome to participate regardless of age or talent. If you'd like to perform in the show, we ask that you donate a filled shoebox with a $10 shipping fee by Sunday, October 2nd. And if you would like to attend the show in the audience, the admission is $1. We'll also be selling hot dogs, chips, drinks, and baked goods that evening, and all of the proceeds go directly toward helping make a difference in the life of a child. Of course, we would always love to have volunteers to help sell the tickets, operate cameras, and hand out food. So please email me for more information or to sign up to perform or volunteer at keen1103 at gmail.com. 
Thank you in advance for helping to spread the love of Jesus Christ to kids across the globe. Good morning. We are glad that you are with us today. We're going to kind of do some announcements to get us started um, as we talk about uh, Hurricane Ian. Right? It was Ian, right? That was his name, Ian. Uh, and so just kind of where we're at and all that. So I got some notes. First off, if you'd like to, to help uh, with primarily with Southwest Florida recovery, we have a lot of recovery up in our area, uh, but also in Southwest Florida, uh, there's something we call the United Methodist Committee on Relief. It's also known. All right, oh, June Bingham, June. June, Judy, grab June, this is because I'm the preacher, June, get them in here and tell them to be quiet, B Bishop laid hands on me at one point and said take thou authority, that's never been an issue, all right, uh, just so you can know, if you'd like to make a financial donation, the United Methodist Committee on Relief. 100% uh, of what you give goes to help victims uh, from the hurricane. That's because every every month you give gifts to our church. We play something called our apportionments, our connectional giving, and that supports all the infrastructure uh, for United Methodist Committee on Relief. They are already on the ground in multiple places working. We have a member of our church, uh, Haley uh, Shoemaker, who uh, they were actually going to do a baptism today of uh, their daughter couldn't be here because she's one of the disaster recovery coordinators uh, for our state. And so if you want to make that donation, you can go online to the website and it says uh, you click on the giving link and click UMCOR. 100% goes to uh, United Methodist Committee on Relief. You can drop a check off in the back and just mark on your check. Make it to First United, but mark on the check UMCOR um, and that will go straight to them. If you want to do some hands-on work, uh, tomorrow morning at 10 a.m., a group is going to meet here, the youth group. Uh, they don't have school tomorrow, and so some of our youth group members and Dylan and I are going to take the bus down to the Beacon Center. But if any adults want to go with us, uh, the Beacon Center, 
the only domestic violence shelter in our area, had a lot of damage. There's still a few trees, so we need a couple chainsaws. Um, there are some trees down, and the cleanup work, and they had, most of their fencing got knocked down. And Angie, is ho the director of the Beacon Center, is hoping to have some mesh fencing up uh, because you, the, the violence center wants to make, uh, shelter wants to make sure people can't get in and out. Uh, so we'll be doing some of that work uh, tomorrow. So we're going to meet at, at, at 10. Uh, we said we do about a couple hours of work. If you're interested in doing that, be here at the church uh, by 10 o'clock. Now, I do want to update you about the church. We, we are learning minute by minute we had more damage than we thought uh, here at the church. Uh, first off, we have some power. The lights are on. Uh, uh, and what you're really going to like is at some point, the lights are going to come on, and you're going to be like, oh, and then they're going to go off. And then they're going to go on, and we have no control on that. Uh, FPL says you don't, we have power, and we're telling them we don't fully have uh, power because their air conditioning uh, is not working. Uh, so we've got that going on, but we, we, we figured we made some decisions yesterday. We could do worship over there, and we had air, but, it was, but fortunately we made a decision not to do it over there. We'll tell you why in a second. And we said we could do outside. We're just going to do it inside. It's easier to do it uh, that way. So no air. If you get hot, fan yourself. All right, there you go. Do want to let you know over there, we do have a major issue over, over there. Our back alley flooded. Uh, we, we Actually, what you may not know is we drained it. Uh, our pumps kicked in gear, drained it, couldn't keep up with the volume. Battery went out on the generators. So we, we had about five inches of water in the youth room and the janitor's closet and all that. What you don't know is we drained everything yesterday. That road was completely dry yesterday afternoon. Brett was thrilled, let the water restoration guys here. Three o'clock, they texted him saying, hey, uh, here's a video of water bubbling up in the room. We don't know where it's coming from. So we've had to turn off all the water over there. There are no bathrooms over there. Uh, and the children's wing and youth wing are off limits. Children and youth are in the multi-purpose room and all that kind of stuff. So we got a lot of stuff going over there. We'll keep you updated on that. Uh, but we wanted you to be aware of that. And then I, I was talking to some friends of mine. I mean, it, it is frustrating. I'm a whiner. Let's just admit that. Uh, and I, I can whine about not having electricity and having to shower in the dark and having to take quick showers because someone in our family wanted to make sure we were quick showers to have heat for everybody. But I figured some people could suffer. <laughs> and to have to cook in the dark, you whine about that. And then to have a church building that's got all kind of issues on it. But then I see pictures of friends of mine that have uh, four feet of water in their church still and no roof and those kind of things. And it's hard. My friend McGray and I were talking. He, uh, he's going to preach a sermon today on survivor guilt. I chose not to. We're going to stick with our, our current topic. But McGray and I were talking, and he's like, you know, why is it we feel like God blessed us because we were spared? And does Southwest Florida not have God's blessing? There's a weird dynamic that goes on with that when we pray. And I, I was struggling with that the other day. I'm like, do I really, you know, back when we didn't know exactly where Ian was going, do we pray for it to hit Texas? I mean, I'm fine with that, <laughs> all right? But there seems to be something wrong uh, uh, with that. And so I, I, I just generally pray for safety and protection and for, and for God to move. And so now as we start the recovery and the cleanup, I mean, people's lives in Southwest Florida those of us who can remember Andrew and lived through some of the Andrew stuff, it, it takes years and years and years to recover from a, a catastrophic uh, hurricane such as this. I mean, I, the stuff I we got, what, 18 inches of rain here in Volusia County? Um, that, and we think that's where our water's coming from, is there's still so much groundwater. It's just seeping in through the side walls uh, kind of stuff. But let's, let's take a moment to pray for everything and everybody. God, we do gather here today, and we are grateful. We have a roof over our heads. We're grumpy. We don't have air conditioning. But that's a minor inconvenience. Uh, people have been worshiping in Florida churches for hundreds of years without air conditioning. We ask for your blessings on us, Lord, uh, as we here in Volusia County have to do recovery work in our own area. We have church members who have some flooding issues. We have a church that's flooded. Some of us still don't, some people still don't have power. Some people don't have homes. But we are grateful for our lives and for health and, and for the ability to rebuild. Uh, Everything that we have, we can, we, we can rebuild. We pray for Southwest Florida, for Port Charlotte and Punta Gorda and uh, Fort Myers, Sanibel, and all those areas that today are waking up and, and seeing homes that don't have, all they have is a foundation. And God, we don't know exactly 
I don't know exactly how to pray for it, but you tell me that when the earth rumbles and the mountains roar and the seas crash to be still and to know that you are God. And so in this moment, in this stillness in the Lord, as we gather for worship, remind us you are God and that you fail us not. In your name we pray. Amen. Let's stand as we sing.
Man, it's so great to see you guys here. I know the donut truck was a big inspiration to get people out <laughs> of their houses today, but uh, hey, as you can see, we're pretty acoustic. We don't have a drummer or a bass player. We have very little bench depth, so if you have any talent, come see me, because we would love to have you uh, help us out with the band if you uh, play an instrument like that. But we're going to continue to worship God this morning, so sing along. I love you, Lord. Oh, your mercy never fails me. All my days I've been held in your hand. From the moment that I wake up until I lay my head, I will see of the goodness of God. All my life you have been faithful. All my life you have been so, so good. With every breath I love your voice. You have led me through the fire. In darkest nights, you are close like no other. I've known you as a father. I've known you as a friend. And I have lived in the of God. All my life you have been faithful. All my life you have been so, so good. With every breath that I am able, I will see of the goodness of God. Your goodness is running after, it's running after me. Your goodness is running after, it's running after me. With my life laid down, I surrender now. I give you It's running after, it's running after me. Your goodness is running after, it's running after me. Your goodness is running after, it's running after me. With my life laid down, I surrender now. I give you everything. Your goodness is running after, it's running after me. And all my life you have been faithful. All my life you have been so, so good. of the goodness of God. All my life you have been faithful. All my life you have been so, so good. With every breath of 
the goodness of God. I'm going to sing of the goodness of God. God, we do praise you that you are always faithful, Lord. And like you left the 99 to find the one, you will keep running after us, Lord. And we just thank you for that. In Jesus' name, amen. Good morning, Amy. Where's my gift? Gift? It's my birthday. Where's my gift? You do understand that we film these not on the actual day. Uh, today is not October 2nd in my book, so I still have a couple more days to find you something. 20 bucks that she didn't give me anything. So fine. What, what, uh, what's the favorite gift you've ever, someone's ever given you? Some, a gift you got maybe on your birthday or something. What's your favorite gift? Oh, my grandmother gave me tickets to see the show Les Mis live, and it was wonderful. And we went together. What's your favorite gift? Uh, my mother-in-law gave me the original 1948 FSU pennant when <gasps> Florida State University became Florida State. That's what you said you would grab if your house burns down. If my down. house burns down, yeah. My, uh, her sister went to FSU the year became Florida State University. That's a pretty good one. It is. Scott, why do we give gifts on birthdays, anniversaries, and Christmas anyway? Uh, evidently, you don't. <laughs> uh, but we do. Uh, yeah, uh, we, I guess because we have to. It's a silly, it's a silly little custom. I mean, Chris and I aren't gift givers. It's, it's, it's a little annoying, uh, which is a good thing. Chris doesn't give gifts and I don't, because otherwise we'd really be uh, in a lot of trouble. That's sad. I love getting gifts. We give gifts because we love. Well, that's supposed to be okay. the reason. We give because of the relationship. God gives us the gift of Jesus out of the love for the world. It says, for God so loved the world that God gave God's only son. Yeah, God gives to us because God loves us. So I guess when we give back, it's because we love. It's supposed to be. I'm sure that some give out of a sense of obligation. Some probably even give out of guilt. But the scripture tells us we give out of the love of our hearts. Isn't that sweet? So when you, when you think about putting God first in your finances, it's not an obligation or a guilt trip or requirement, but it's an act of love. Because we love God, we put God first in everything, including our finances. I want to thank you for loving First United and The Gathering Place and giving your gifts to God here. Let's pray. Holy God, every good and perfect gift comes from you. Help us to love and to be generous givers, not out of obligation or requirement, but because you first loved us, because you gave your son, Jesus Christ, as the ultimate gift out of perfect love. In your holy name we pray, amen. Plenty of time to go give me a gift before we record the next video. Ooh, we'll see. <laughs> to tell you we only have one screen today but y'all probably figured that out uh, and I may said may, our church may have had a stroke because this side works well but we have no screen sound issues and the women's bathroom lights don't work the men's work fine uh, also we uh, we do still uh, the coastal donuts truck will be here when this service is over uh, we had planned to do that if you filled out your connect card last week uh, you should have gotten an email saying, hey, thank you for doing that, and a $2 off coupon uh, for the Coastal Donut Truck. And I said, if you were a first-time guest today, and yes, you have to be a first-time guest today. Don't say it's my first Sunday in a long time. Uh, but if it's your first time uh, if, it's your, if it's your first time here, that we, we'd cover a donut or a coffee for you on that. So see me after church. Let me know uh, you're, you're a first-time uh, guest on that. All right? So 
I did decide, I, I kind of, as I told you, I kind of debated back and forth. Do we talk about the hurricane and do a sermon on that? Um, and just kind of went with the decision. You know, it's World Communion Sunday. We had some stuff planned for World Communion Sunday, and we're going to go in that direction. There are a few things we kind of said, well, with the hurricane, we can't do necessarily, but we're going to move, we're gonna, or we thought we couldn't, we're going to move in this direction and stick with what we've been doing. Because we've been looking at a series uh, called uh, The Journey of Faith, The Wesleyan Way, kind of our understanding of why are we United Methodists. We've been looking at this guy, John Wesley, the person who founded the movement that became the United Methodist Church, but really what we've been looking at is our basic theology. This is what we love about being Methodist, why we're going to stay a Methodist, and we've been talking about it in this way, and, and hopefully you've got the motions down. If you haven't, let's pick it up, people, okay, because Methodists, people called Methodists are people with warm hearts, busy hands, and an open mind, okay, remember, warm heart, busy hand, open mind. It's the warm heart is that understanding that God's love and God's grace is in my life. It's a personal assurance of salvation. It's a relationship with Jesus Christ. It's that moment you grab a hold of God's love and you don't let go. you got that warm heart. And then we say it's busy hands. It's the busy hands that are doing the work uh, of God that we, because God loves us, we get out in the world and we make a difference. I mean, that was what I was thrilled with yesterday. Some folks going down on the Beacon Center doing stuff, us helping out our neighbors and doing the cleanup work during when a hurricane happens. I mean, you can see the evidence uh, of how we're called to compact. But we do that more than just when a hurricane hits. We're busy trying to build God's kingdom here. And building God's kingdom here isn't just helping repair things. It, it literally is loving your neighbor. Like, I don't know if you went to Publix before or right after the hurricane. We need more busy hands in Publix. We need to be kinder and nicer at the gas pumps as well when a hurricane uh, shows up. That's part of our role as followers of Christ is to act Christ-like even when the world is closing in on us. And so we got the warm hearts, we got the busy hands, and the open mind. Methodists, we, we, we don't check our brains at the door. We don't talk about this is what you have to believe and you're done. We want to encourage you to think and to understand through scripture and reason, tradition, and experience. To you, we believe God gave us a brain. Use it to help grow and understand uh, your faith. So we've been talking about that over uh, the last uh, several weeks. But I realize I've never told you why I'm United Methodist. So let me tell you why I'm United, it's my birthday, so let me tell you why I'm United Methodist. We're going to talk about me today. Why I'm United Methodist. Re I, here's the reason. I grew up Methodist. Uh, I, actually, the United Methodist Church started right when I was born. Me and the Methodist, United Methodist Church, uh, they formed right about the time I, I, I was born and became the United Methodist Church. And, and, and we always went to First United Methodist Church in Williston, Florida. That's where we went. My family had our pew. We were just like y'all. We never moved seats. We sat in the same pew. In fact, one of my favorite memories of going to church was a Christmas Eve when I was in the eighth grade because you dress up for Christmas Eve. And you want to kind of pimp yourself as you walk through. In the eighth grade, because you never know who might be in the room. And I'm kind of strolling through, and my sister stopped, and I hit her. I'm like, what are you doing? And she's like, there's somebody in our seat. And the audacity of these foreigners, because obviously they were not from Williston, or heathens, because why would they be sitting in the Smith pew? I mean, it was, we, we went to that, I went to that church because my daddy went to that church, and my granddaddy went to that church. My great-great-grand, my great-granddaddy and my great-great-granddaddy put the cornerstone when they built the church in 1920, and I think my great-great-great-granddaddy gave property what became they called it orange hill methodist became orange hill cemetery we i think we gave that property originally and to the church to have a building there and then they moved i mean we, we've always i was i was baptized united methodist i was confirmed uh united methodist i worked at a united methodist youth camp i got married in a united methodist church in miami in south miami I was a United methodist youth director i mean i was united methodist and i went to seminary to be a united methodist pastor and i went why which is probably the late time to start thinking about it. But when I was in seminary, I kind of made the decision, well, if you're going to do this, if you're going to be ordained in this denomination, maybe figure out why, other than I just always have. And so I actually kind of explored and thought about some other uh, denominations. I, I did not decide to leave the, the Christian faith. I wasn't like looking at everything outside of Christianity. I still was really big on Jesus. But I wanted to see where, what were the other options. And i got to tell you, in, in my, I love Roman Catholic tradition and theology. Roman Catholic theology that's not taught by southernized uh, Protestant people. 
because Southern Protestants have an idea of this is what Catholics believe. Actually, when you study some of their theology, it is brilliant theology and wonderful traditions. I love that about the Roman Catholic Church. The celibacy thing was an issue. I'm just letting you know that we, we moved on quickly uh, past the Roman Catholic Church for that reason. But I still love that. I, I, I explored, e I like Eastern Orthodox. Oh, the smells and bells of the Eastern Orthodox Church. My wife will tell you I, I will burn incense like it is going out of style. Uh, just something about that. And there, the Eastern Orthodox theology, the ability to, to embrace mystery and the mystical side of faith, that they don't have to have all the answers, and they're comfortable with that, really drew me. And I especially was drawn to their understanding of the cross, their, their theology of the cross, and their understanding that sin isn't a curse, but more a disease from which we need to be healed. I, I love that. And then I learned that John Wesley, the founder of the Methodist movement, was really influenced by Eastern thought, primarily some Cap what they call the Cappadocian Fathers, St. Gregory of Nazianzus, St. Basil the Great, and St. Gregory of Nyssa. Like, oh, that was awesome, but not for me. The beard thing and all that. And then I say, well, John Wesley was Anglican. That's, that's the Episcopal Church in the U.S. And so we kind of did support the Episcopal. And I love, I love the Episcopal liturgy. And the structure and all of that. I, I, I resonate with, I, I love liturgy. In fact, most of my daily prayer life is very liturgical in rhythm. And, and I love that. Modern method is like, we don't like that. We don't want like, to be. Y listen, y'all like liturgy. We do the same stinking thing every week. If we try to change it, I don't like that. It tells me, you know, we like, we like our structure, our form, our, our rhythms and stuff. And I'm always kind of looking to bring some liturgy in it. But eventually, I, I just went, you know what, I'm going to stay Methodist. Stay, and let me tell you, there are three reasons I stayed United Methodist. One, I don't like change. And that was a lot. I'd already started the process. I didn't want to start over. Uh, two, I, I really like the Methodist understanding of free will. Methodists are, hey, God gave your brain, use it. You have the ability to choose, to make decisions, to learn, that God's not some puppet master up in heaven kind of doing this. John Wesley lived at a time where the reformers were really big. And there was this, there's this reformer, Calvin, and he talked a lot about predestination and God determining everything happening and that some people are saved and some people are, are going to hell no matter what, just because it worked that way, because God's up there doing all, that everything happens for a reason. And John's like, no, it does not. That God has a will, and God has a plan, and God has a purpose, and God has a design for us. But God gave us a brain and wants us to have the ability to choose and to do things, and wants us to use things. And, 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 and Methodists were like, hey, we're we not check our brains at the door. We're going to use scripture, tradition, reason, and experience to help us understand. But I can choose to accept God's love, or I can push it away. I can choose to be part of God's plan to rebuild heaven and earth, or I can choose to do my own thing and bring chaos into this world. But God, God won't give up on me. God won't quit on me, but God ain't going to force it on me either. And so I love that. But the real reason I, I say United Methodist is it's all about grace, baby. Uh, God loves you, period. That, that's why I stayed United Methodist. We Methodists, we, every denomination has something they kind of say, Methodists, we are all about grace. And I, I like that. We're all about grace, baby. I just stole that from Al Davis. Just win, baby. Methodists, it's all about grace, baby. All right, that's it. That God loves you, period. There's nothing you can do to make God love you anymore. There's nothing you can do to stop God loving you. That God's love is going to work in your life. And, and this passage we looked at last week tells us it uh, from Ephesians. For it is by grace you have been saved. You haven't done anything. This isn't something you've done. You haven't earned it. You haven't worked your way towards it. You aren't, you aren't God's favorite. We all know I am, okay? So, I mean, there's... For it is by grace you have been saved through faith. This is not from yourselves. It is, the, it is, a, it is something God gives you. It's something that's been given to you, and you just receive it. This is the gift is of God, not by work, so that no one can boast... For we are God's handiwork, uh, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God has prepared for us in advance to do. That, that, that's what, what we're about. It's, we know this. It's not what we have done. John tells us in the letter of 1 John, he goes, this is how we know God loves us. This is how God showed his love among us. That God sent his one and only son into the world, that we might live through him. This is the gift that God gives us is Jesus. This is love. Not that we love God 
See, it's not us. It's not what we're doing. Not that we love God, but that God loved us and sent his son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. So literally what God is saying is, y'all ain't done anything, but I'm going to give you this gift because I, lo I love you. This is, dear friends, since God so loved us, we also ought to love one another, even in public during a hurricane. No one has ever seen God, but if we love one another, God lives in us, and his love is made complete in us. How do we know God loves us? We can see it of Jesus in the cross. This is how we know God loves us, uh, that he sent his only son. And we Methodists, we're so big into grace that we talk about grace in three ways. That's how big we are. We talk about grace in three different ways. We talk about prevenient grace. This is the grace that goes before. This is God wooing you and pursuing you and calling you into a relationship. It's what Paul says in Romans. God demonstrates his own love for us. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. God's prevenient grace is there as a shepherd who looks at his pen and goes, only got 99 in here. One's lost. And what does the shepherd do? That shepherd goes and looks for the lost. That's prevenient grace. You see and experience prevenient grace when you look back at your life. It's hard to see prevenient grace in the moment, but some of us who are in a relationship with Jesus Christ, we can look back over our lives and go, uh, that's when God did this and this. And it, that, it's that moment where God, God won't give up on you. God pursues you and woos you and calls you into that relationship. But there comes a moment in that relationship when you say yes to God's love. We call that justifying grace. That's that moment where the gift is being given to you and you grab a hold of it. You grab a hold of God's love. It's in Romans, if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your hearts that God raised you, him from the dead, then you will be saved. That's, that's justifying grace. That's things have been made right. You, you, you grab a hold of God and you don't let go. But God isn't done with you there. That, that's one of the things I'm going to tell you that separates the Methodist church from several other churches is we believe you need to be in that relationship with Jesus Christ and then you need to get your butt busy. You got to have them busy hands. We want you doing something because of God's love and God's grace. And because you grabbed a hold of God, what are you doing to bring God's kingdom here? And we've talked about this called sanctifying grace, that we've been saved to do good works. It says that in, in Ephesians. Uh, for we are God's handiwork created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. And, and that's not just good works in, in helping Beacon Center, being nice at, and forgiving at, at Publix. It means in my own personal life, I'm studying Scripture, I'm reading, I'm growing, I'm, I'm discerning, I'm trying to become more christ so we've got provenient grace and justifying grace and sanctifying grace. But, and, I, and that's one of the reasons I stayed Methodist, but if you were to push me on why am I United Methodist and why will I stay United Methodist, right here, is this meal. Because this meal is all about grace. God loves you, period. I, I realized this, I was working on my sermon thinking about it this morning. I actually think God at communion time is a big southern grandma. Y'all come. Because every grandma I've ever met had plenty of room at the table for one more person. And if you walk by the house, come on. We got, we got plenty. Come on in, right? That's what this meal is. Uh, and what I love about this meal, what I love about the United Methodist Church, it really does separate us out from lots of other groups. Everybody's welcome. We don't have rules or regulations. We don't have things you have to do. I, I say it every week. All things are ready. When you are ready... Come, taste, and see. Because when you're ready, God's ready for you. God's not going to push you and make you, but God certainly wants you to come and receive. Because when you're ready, God's ready, and all are welcome at, at this table. And, and, and I, I love this. And we, we, believe that, uh, we believe that everybody gets a seat at, at, at this table. And, and there is no proof this is why, but there is a story that's told about John Wesley, um, where he, he refused somebody communion. The story is in the 1730s, he came to Georgia uh, to minister to the heathens, and after seeing their football team play, <laughs> minister to the heathens. Uh, and in Georgia, he met a woman named Sophia Hopke, and she was smitten by John, and her and her dad were trying to work out a deal with John, and John liked her, and they were trying to get this marriage thing worked out. 
But John, for whatever reason, wasn't ready to get married, uh, mainly because I felt like he had this call he had to go do, he had to earn his salvation. His and so he goes to do ministry to the Cherokee Indians. And when he comes back from Cherokee land, which was a miserable failure, he comes back to discover that Sophia was smitten with him, but she was done with him. And she had found a new man. And so John was doing communion and service, and Sophia came forward for communion, and he went, nope. I mean, can you imagine that? Body of Christ given for you. Body of Christ given for you. You dump me, no soup for you. Body of Christ given for you. <laughs> I, I mean, it's a horrible, horrible moment. In fact, because he was a priest in the Church of England, meant he could be charged with a crime. So her dad charged him with uh, slander and defamation of character. He had to go to Charleston, hop on a ship, and get back to England to escape a trial. There is no proof that that's why we have an open communion table. <laughs> but it does stick with me what it's like to be told you're not welcome here. I mean, can you imagine coming forward to receive communion and have somebody tell you, hmm, nah. I, I'll be honest, it, I'm, I'm glad I don't have to make that choice. Because there's some mornings I'm like, <laughs> really? You're coming down? <laughs> Good for you. It's not about me. It's about God's grace. Right? I, I think we should say every Sunday, y'all come. Because it's, it, it's, it's all about grace. And, and I love that everybody gets to come forward uh, for communion. Now, I've had some people kind of tell me, Y'all uh, y'all don't ever do an altar call at church. Sure we do. Every week. It's communion. Uh, by the way, you know altar call. John Wesley never did an altar call. Not one altar call in John Wesley's life. Thousands of people came to Christ because of Wesley. He, you know why he didn't do an altar call? No one did them. They're an eight, late 1800s addition to Christianity. People weren't coming forward to the altar. They were accepting Christ, but it wasn't a... What, what I see in this meal is an altar call. What we would call an altar call. Because we believe in this meal that God's love and God's grace is so real that you could come forward a sinner and have your heart transformed in this moment. And I'm letting you know, if today you get up to come forward to receive communion, you are making a conscious decision that somehow you believe in something. And you may be confessing, when I am, I hope you confess when you come forward, I'm confessing, there were some moments during the hurricane, I really messed up, this is my fault. My wife had asked me like five times, did you check the generator? I laughed. I discovered that my generator has an automatic shutoff valve if it doesn't have enough oil, which would have been helpful on Tuesday. On Thursday, I was scrambling in the hurricane winds to get my oil from my neighbor <laughs> to crank the generator, right? So I will come forward and confess the hour and a half that I spent out there trying to get that thing started and the things I said and did that were not Christ-like in any manner or capacity, right? We make a joke about that, but I bet there are other things that happened this week. But you confessed, and we believe in this meal, in this moment, that something happened, and you go from being a sinner into a saint. And I love it's that moment is the body of Christ given for you, and the blood of Christ shed for you, and you receive that grace, and then you turn and you walk back. I hope in that moment of turning, that's your repentance moment, that you, you have made the decision that you're going to act differently because of what God has done in your life and go out there to live differently. And, and so I, I have seen moments in my ministry where God has changed people. So I'll tell you a few stories about that. And none of them are for here. People say, well, you'll never really tell a lot of stories about our church. Like, no, because what happens when you tell stories about a church, somebody's sitting there, people are like, huh. Anyhow, at the church I came from, there was a Saturday night service where a woman named Barbara showed up, and we were in a jam. We were not the most organized church in uh, 
back back in those days at, at, at COF. And we were in a jam at our Saturday night service, and Sandy came to me, and Sandy was a lot like Terry here. She kind of kept everything organized, kept everybody. Sandy's like, I don't have enough communion service. We don't have enough communion service. I'm like, fine. Barbara's walking in. I'm like, Barbara, you're serving communion. Come on, let's serve communion. She goes, I can't serve communion. I'm like, it's really not that hard. You just take the cup. This is the blood of Christ shed for you. Good to go. Thanks. Boom. Did it. Not the best theological training, understand, but we were in a jam. And so up front, Barbara's serving, she's literally, she is literally just holding this, and she had snot tears coming out. I mean, this wasn't, this wasn't, this, this was nasty crying kind of stuff, and I'm like, I messed up. So I went to her after the service, and I went, Barbara, I, 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 I was assuming she had anxiety issues, being up in front of people, making her do something she didn't want to do, and I just took that authority and did it, right? And so I, I'm like, Barbara, I'm, I'm so sorry. I, I didn't mean to put you on the spot like that. And eventually through the tears, she said, no, you, you don't understand. I'm Catholic. What I learned over the years, if you were born Catholic, you may join another church, but you're going to die Catholic because you are always, I mean, that's just one of the great things about the Catholic Church. Uh, but she, she said, I'm Catholic. She was a member of our church, active in our church, but you know, she goes, I'm Catholic, and I'm divorced. I'm not allowed to take communion in church, and you're asking me to serve communion. I want to be part of a church that allows, uh, no, I don't need that screen up yet. I, I want to be part of a church that allows people who have had trauma and hurt and brokenness in their life find healing and hope through Jesus Christ. They don't need to be told how bad they are. Uh, they need to hear how good God loves them. That's what I want, I want to be part. I want to be part of that church. There's another story from uh, over there. Um, I did. I did a funeral uh, for a woman's father. She came to me and said, "Hey, can you can you do my dad's funeral? He he uh, was quasi. She described him this way. He's quasi Catholic." But we can't do it in the church. Would you, would you do his funeral? And I was like, sure. And we didn't have a church building at that point, so we did it at a local funeral home. And I'm doing the funeral, and she said, can I read something at his funeral? Like, yeah, not a problem. I'm like, right. Got up afterwards, and like, she was done. And I said, man, that, that was beautiful. Her name is Roxanne. I said, Roxanne, that was beautiful. Uh, I never heard that scripture before. What scripture? Where's that from? She goes, oh, it's from the Koran. She goes, I didn't tell you I'm Muslim. We grew up in Kuwait. My mom was, well, was Kuwaiti. My dad was an oil worker. I was like, I learned maybe read what people are going to read before the funeral kind of thing, uh, kind of stuff. Um, but she and her kids started coming to our church after 9-11 uh, because we did a community service with a bunch of, I'm sure you all did too, a community service. And all the other pastors in the community refused to do the Matthew passage, pray for your enemies and bless those that persecute you. And I said, I can't be a minister of the gospel and not in the most horrific moment, not acknowledge and pray for my enemies. That's what Christians do. And so we did. And she and her family started coming through our kids group and through our youth group and eventually started in a communion moment when she received communion. I've seen lives, I've seen lives transformed. In, in that moment. I, I want to be part of that church. That's why I'm Methodist. I want to be part of the church because Jen and Carrie joined the church over there. And Jen and Carrie came and were active in church and receiving communion and wanted to join the church and said, but we need to meet with you before we join the church. And they're in my office and they're chit-chatting with me about stupid stuff that has nothing to do with why they were there. And I finally went, why are you here? And Jen goes, well, we're gay. I was like, oh my God. It was fairly obvious. And she goes, well, how did you know? I'm like, well, you live together, you sit right next to each other, but y'all don't sit next to each other like roommates. So, I mean, I'm, I looked at her and went, I'm slow, not stupid. And she goes, we just want to be welcome here. And I said, well, what do you feel? Are, are you? And they went, yeah. I said, I can't promise you that everybody will make you feel welcome and accepted here. I can't, I can't make other people do things. But I can promise you, you will all, I will always make sure you're welcome here. And if somebody gives you a hard time, let me know. I'll take care of them. And then I looked over at, at Carrie and said, tell me why you want to join the church. Oh, by the way, uh, Carrie, when's our joining service? 16th? If you join the church, you want to join on the 16th? Is that right? Yeah. 
So if you're interested in joining the church, join us. We're doing a membership on the 16th. Talk to Terry after the service. And virtual people, you can join virtually. Ann will be here next week to tell us a little bit about how to do that. But I asked Carrie, hey, tell me why you want to join the church. And she said, I met Jesus here, and I want to know more. Folks, you ever want to know why to join the church? If a preacher ever asks you why do you want to join the church, that's the answer. <laughs> Anything else fails in comparison uh, to that. I met Jesus, and I want to know more. I, I want to be a part of a church that says communion is, is for all people. Uh, I want to be part of a church. Uh, uh, today is World Communion Sunday. I don't know if you're aware of this. George W. Bush is a United Methodist. Hillary Clinton is a United Methodist. They aren't in the same party, are they? They don't see eye to eye politically. Yet yeah, they come together to worship one body, one blood, one in Christ, right? I want to be part of a church that trumps politics, where faith trumps politics. I want to be part of a church where abortion providers and uh, people who've had abortions aren't judged and made to feel guilty about what they're doing because of their theological and political understanding. And I want to be part of a church, I'm using abortion as an issue because everybody, oh, I want to be part of a church where uh, if you're a pro, what we would say pro-life or rights of the unborn, that you can kneel together and realize we're, we're working this out, we're figuring this out together because we're one with Christ. I want to be part of that church. And it's hard and it's rough and it rubs against us. That's why it's all about grace, baby. That's just got to be about grace and, and to work that. I want to be part of that. I want to be part of that church. I want to be part of a church. Amy right now is over at the gathering place. She is preaching and she is leading in communion. And she is a woman. And there are lots of churches in Ormond Beach that say that can't happen. And I want to be part of a church that says we're not going to let one or two scripture passages dictate our theology. But we're going to use scripture, reason, tradition, and experience to help us understand the whole corpus of scripture and what it means to be faithful. And if God is calling you, then God is going to call you. That, that, I want to be part of that kind uh, of church. Uh, and, and that all are welcome uh, in, in this moment. And I know some people are out there, some people out there go, you know, you just need to preach on people should stop sinning. In fact, some people have told me you need to have more sermons about stopping sin, uh, which is interesting. I, I don't want to be part of a church where my job is to point out your sins. I want to be part of a church where I point out God loves you, and you and God figure out your sin. Right? But if you're some, one of those people that says, hey, let's, we need, you need to preach more sermons on sin, let's start with yours, shall we? And if you'll email me your sins, I'll preach on one next week. But have you noticed you want to start on somebody else's sins? Hey, I want to be part of a church where I'm going to let you and God work out your sin. And I'm going to be the one telling you God loves you, period. But if we're going to start with sin, maybe we should start with our own. And a United Methodist Church hasn't always had an open communion table. I learned this uh, recently. In 1784, when the Methodist Church began in the U.S., our book of discipline had a line in it. If you owned slaves, you could not be part of a Methodist society and class meeting group. If you owned slaves. We never enforced that. Then, in 1792, Richard Allen and Absalom Jones were in St. George's Church in Philadelphia, the city of brotherly love. They received communion and had knelt in prayer. Richard Allen was a phenomenal Methodist preacher. I mean, crowds flocked to hear him preach. He would preach at 5 in the morning, and they said thousands would join him. How many of y'all going to show up at 5 in the morning, right? Dude could preach if you're doing that. Well, actually, there was a reason people could show up at 5 in the morning, because who he was preaching to. Richard Allen was black, and he was preaching to mainly to slaves. And so was Absalom Jones. And they knelt at St. George's Church, and a trustee came up to him and said, You can't kneel. Right? And the Methodist church began to fracture and split over that because we said some people couldn't be here because of the skin color or whatever. And then in 1844, the Methodist church split because uh, one group said, we, we don't think there should be slavery. One group said uh, there needs to be slavery. And people say, oh, well, one church, the northern church wasn't racist. No, the northern church was racist. They just didn't think slaves were a good idea. And the southern church, was, well, we, were, we had issues kind of thing, right? The Civil War, does anybody know when the Civil War was fought? 
1861 to 1865. Reconstruction was over in 1877. The Methodist Church separated in 1844. Do you know when we came back together? 1939. The country had already begun to heal itself. The church still stayed. What's interesting, though, in 1939, the only way we came back was to say, well, let's create some provisions so there's white churches and black churches, and they're different. And the black churches will be at uh, what we call central conferences and have their own stuff, but they won't have to intermix with whites. And we changed that in 1968. Uh, so may maybe we need to confess that sin, which, which I, for me, warm heart, open mind, busy hands. This is my, one of my favorite pictures. So the dude in the middle is Frank Adams. Uh, the dude on the end that's not me is Kevin James. Kevin's the pastor at uh, Palm Coast United Methodist Church. That was taken in June because uh, Frank Adams was part of our church over in Four Corners. He was part of our Sunday night uh, small group that I was part of. He was a uh, director at Disney uh, in food and beverages but felt called into ministry. And so this, this year, I got to lay hands on Frank, who is six foot. I mean, he's huge. He's like six, four and a half, six, five, big guy pushed him down and laid hands on him uh, so he could be ordained in the United Methodist Church. I want to be part of a church that though at one point we said, hey, y'all can't kneel here, but we're going to do that later on. Because that's what this meal is all about. God's like a big grandma saying, y'all come. There is plenty of room because it is all about grace. And so if you ask me why I'm Methodist, there you go. Today is World Communion Sunday, and we had a great idea kind of to show you we come from different walks and backgrounds and understandings, but the one thing that calls us together is Jesus Christ in this meal, in this moment. And so we have the liturgy. And Jason, did we ever figure out, did we get the words up? So we have another glitch. Because we had the wording under it for you to join us, but, uh, okay, we'll trust the Spirit will intercede on our behalf as we go through the liturgy. This is the communion liturgy of the United Methodist Church for, world, for communion. And it's read by people in our church and our community who sit among you on Sunday mornings, but it's read in some of their native tongues. Take a look. Lift up your hearts. Lift up, duty need a soul, need a sing. Demos gracias al Señor nuestro Dios. Es es richtig, unseren Dank und unser Lob auszusprechen. Der Rest war ein gut und glädlich Ding. Alles wird er überall und tacke dei am Mächtigen Fall. Himmelens und Juden Skaper. Tu as fait d'un seul chaque nation et peuple pour vivre sur toute la face de la terre. Ani wa me gari di te jun e jun be sen e ke ti jun so e jun shu jia zhe hui e lu li e mia ge gari di yong be zhong ji e xi gua. Son Jesus Christ. By the baptism of his suffering, death, and resurrection, you gave birth to your church, delivered us from slavery to sin and death, and made with us a new covenant by water and the Spirit. Él nos encargó a ser sus testigos hasta el final del mundo, haciendo discípulos de todas las naciones. Y hoy, en todo el mundo, su familia se reúne ante su mesa. Dantabe 
，刺，就是我的身体为你折的，你要纪念我。Als das Abendmahl zu Ende war, nahm er den Kelch, dankte, gab ihn seinen Jüngern und sagte: Trinkt daraus, ihr alle. Dies ist mein Blut des neuen Bundes, vergossen für euch und für viele für die Vergebung der Sünden. Tu dies, so oft ihr davon trinkt. 所以为着要纪念你通过耶稣基督所做诶大作为，我要用懊恼甲感谢来做我献给我诶奉献，也要宣告我懊悔诶信仰来甲为着我牺牲诶主结面。Christ has died, Christ is risen, Christ will come again. Christ est mort, le Christ est ressuscité, Christ reviendra. 基督为我们死，基督经营复活，基督将会再来。Christus has died, Christus has died, Christus will come again. Må være i din nær, pastor som taler. Kristo murió, Kristo resucitó, Kristo volverá nuevamente. Kristus er gestorben, Kristus er auferstanden. Christus wird wiederkommen. Kito uuntelanshi, kito ikiengkwa, kito ekelzailai. Pour out your Holy Spirit on us gathered here and on these gifts of the bread and the cup, and make them be for us the body and blood of Christ, that we may be for the world the body of Christ redeemed by His blood. Renueva nuestra comunión con tu Iglesia por todo el mundo, fortalecela en cada nación y en cada pueblo para dar testimonio. Fielmente de tu nombre. Yer os vedim om et me Christus, et me verandro et tjeneste for hele verden, inte Christus kommer i endelig seier, og vi fester oss ved hans himmelske gjester. Par ton fils, Jesus Christ, avec le saint esprit dans sa saint église, tu t'aner et tu crois, sans ta vie, par tout puissant, Dieu, maintenant et pour toujours. Amen. Let's pray. God, we just ask that you pour out your spirit on us gathered here on these gifts. Make them be for us the body and blood of Christ. May we receive the grace that you have given to us, and may we live into that grace. And may we become a place where all are welcome. Make us one with you, one with each other, and one in ministry to the world. In the name of Jesus, who taught us to pray, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. This is the body of Christ, which is given for you. Take and eat, and the blood of Christ, which is shed for you. Drink and receive, and may you be filled with the good news. We got two stations down front, one station in the balcony. We have gluten free to my right, and all three stations have an opportunity if you need to prepackage. But all things are ready. When you're ready, come, taste and see. This table, everyone is welcome. At this table, everyone is seen. At this table, everybody matters. No one falls between. At this table. 
you can say whatever at this table you can speak your mind at this table everything's forgiven there's enough for everyone so come as you Just come as you are. The perfect gift that you can bring is your heart. So come, come as you are. At this table, there will be no judgment. At this table, mercy has a seat. At this table, there will be sons and daughters. There's no place I'd rather be. So come as you are. Remember that the door is always open. So come as you are. The perfect gift that you can bring is your heart. So come, come as you are, come as you are. At this table, everyone is welcome. At this table, everybody cares. At this table, everybody matters. So come, pull up a chair. Hear the good news, you've been invited No matter what others say Your darkest sin will be forgiven You will always have a place At the table of grace The cup's never empty plate's always full and it's never too late so come and be filled love never ending you're always welcome at the table
cup's never empty, the plate's always full, and it's never too We're so glad that you are here with us on World Communion Sunday. Wow, what a great opportunity to worship our living God. I want to share with you a couple things that are coming. Not this Wednesday. We want everyone to recover and recoup, and we hope by next Wednesday, October 12th and 19th, Pastor Scott, I was calling it Wednesday Night Live with Pastor Scott, but he came up with a better name. He's calling it the University of First United. All right. So we want to invite you to the University of First United with Pastor Scott next Wednesday, the next two Wednesdays in October, the 12th and the 19th. He's going to talk to us about the theology of evil. Hmm. Anyway, you don't want to miss it. I hope if you are a first-time guest that you get that donut and then come see me because I have a gift for you as well. So you know what it means that y'all are here? It means that you know you know there's a place for you at the table. You're here because you know God loves you and wants to have a relationship with you. And that makes me so excited because we know that there is room for all in the kingdom of God. But before you go out that door, I want you to think in your heart and in your head, who do I know? Who's in my life that needs that same assurance and encouragement that I got today? Who do you know that needs to know that they're welcome at the table? Let's pray. Father God, we thank you, Lord. We thank you that all are welcome at your table in your kingdom and that you want us all realigned with you, Lord. We come with all our faults and our questions, our insecurity, our mistakes, and our unselfishness, Lord. Or rather, our selfishness, Lord, your unselfishness. Lord, none of it surprises you, absolutely. Lord, I pray your power and your peace, and your love on each and every one that is here today. Lord, help us to uniquely feel your power. Too many of us need healing and hope. Lord, help us to feel it. Help us to love those around us in a new and bigger way. Help us to love them the way you love us. In your holiest name, we all pray. Amen. Hey, uh, is right behind us because of power issues. So they're going to be behind us. If you want something from Coach Donut Truck, if you're a guest, come see me. If first time, I'll get you something to eat. See ya. What's up, homie? 